Okay, now we look at this series. It's really interesting. I'm going to show several subsections. These are all or mostly from cartooning and advertising. But they make the serious point that cartoonists and advertisers have to use the standard icons that will be grasped by everyone in pop culture else who pass by them. So if you want to get a sense of what's really canonical in our culture, this is the work you look to. Now, the, the old ladder of progress from ape to human is just so ingrained that even though we know this is parody, this is the only icon we grasp as evolution. This is our equation of evolution with progress. There's no other way to draw it that people say, ah, this is the parody of evolution. Now, this is the regional series. This is the California version, right? Surf trunks through history. I'm from New York. This is the New Yorker's version. This is uh, the mid-continent version or any area where creationism is a serious issue, sociologically serious, not intellectually serious anywhere. Nobel scientists discover the missing link, and there's a creationist in his right state of the cycle. This is now the American Professions series, and here we see the entire sequence from the amoeba in the upper left all the way down invariably embodying all the other major prejudices of our culture to the white male in the business suit in the lower right. The computer industry loves this metaphor. It's pretty obvious why, because in the computer world, things get lighter and cheaper, right? So you think of the old heavy version. Of course, it had to be held by an ape that was bent over like this. And as the same products get lighter and lighter, you eventually end up with a white male in a business suit holding his power book. This is uh, rock culture's version. And this is another pop culture version. We now come to the uh, international series, just to show you this isn't an entirely American invention. I bought this in a biz the Bazaar of Agra in India several years ago, so it's at least to some extent international. This was a recent commentary on events in Eastern Europe. Romania says, start the evolution without me as Czechoslovakia, Germany, Hungary, and Poland advance up the sequence. Albania is left below. World terrorism parachutes into its appropriate place in the sequence. This is a stamp that recently came out of Australia. I couldn't figure out what that thing on the right was. I thought it was an androgynous pay toilet, but I think it's supposed to be a test tube, and it's a statement about uh, artificial insemination. And this is a British version. Then I regret to say, because it's my culture, there are even similar problems in Israel. This was a Pepsi-Cola ad that appeared a while back. See, it says Pepsi in the lower right there. And uh, we have the march of progress from the ape at the right this time, because in Israel, of course, got to go from right to left. And you'll notice the penultimate character, the white man in the business who's holding a Coke, and then the uh, skateboard has got the right stuff there, the Pepsi. Well, the ultra-Orthodox objected. They didn't like that evolutionary sequence. So look at the sanitized version that then came in. See, now we only have two stages, but they're both anatomically modern people, so you don't have to talk about evolution Shame. Now, this is called the Quintessential Themes of American Life series, namely sexism and sports. What else? Here's a, Mike Peters, who does Mother Goose and Grimm, his commentary on evolution of man, as it, in its gender-biased way used to be called, and, and woman. He did a similar one on bosses and secretaries. Now, these are not sexist cartoons, but commentaries on sexism. Nonetheless, if you were inclined to view this as, as a counteraction to it, I won't object. Anything that gets on a coffee cup in America has canonical status. It's on a coffee cup, so it must be right. Here's the la oh, uh, yes, sports. Sports commentary. That uh, appeared in the Boston Globe before a Patriots-Raiders game several years ago. And the Oak Raiders used to come from Oakland, as you'll remember, so there they are on the left. Here's the last series, just showing that the iconography is so well understood, you can even parody it and show the opposite. And everybody knows what it means. Here's the evolution of U.S. education in the world of Mr. Bush. That's when it came from. Here's someone who's caught the concept of recursion. I love that one. And then you can make it go the other way as well. Here's human evolution from the hunter to the plowman to the auto mechanic to the couch potato. And here's another commentary on my least favorite sport. So be it. Point taken. Now, here's what Darwinian theory is really about. Adaptations are changing local circumstances. Every naturalist has their favorite stories. I'll just give you mine real quick. This looks for all the world like a fish, right? It's got an eye. It's got fins. It wiggles the fins. But it's not a fish. It's the brood pouch of the clam on which it's 
sitting. It holds the embryos of this particular clam. Now, why should a clam evolve a fish-like decoy on its rear end? When you know the life history of this particular clam, it becomes clear. This clam is a member of the group of freshwater mussels, the Unionids. These clams have larvae that must become parasitic on the gill of a fish for a period of time if they have to survive. And that's why this exists, presumably. Fishes come down to nibble or examine. The mother clam shoots the larvae at the fish, some of which attach to the gills and begin their free ride into the next generation. But here's the point. This is not a better clam in any cosmic universal sense. This is not better than a quahog. It's not better than a scallop. It's not better than an oyster. It's just a clam that has evolved an exquisite, exquisite adaptation to a feature of its local environment. That's all. That's all Darwinism is about. It's not about progress. Here's one more example. This also looks for all the world like a fish. It's got an eye. It's got fins. You will have guessed from the last example that it is not a fish either, although this one is part of a fish. It is, in fact, the lure of an anglerfish. Anglerfishes don't move very much. They sit on the bottom. They have detached the first spine of the dorsal fin, moved it forward over the head, and they have evolved at the end of this fin spine a variety of features. Some have little worm-like lures that even collect phosphorescent bacteria. This is the only one we know, found in the Philippines, that has evolved a fish-like lure at the end of its dorsal fin spine, and it literally goes fishing with it. But again, that's wonderful. You look at that, it's awesome, isn't it? But that doesn't make this fish better than a seahorse, better than a marlin, better than a great white shark. It's just a fish with an exquisite adaptation to its own local environment. Final point on this second riddle, why then did evolution triumph is the name for this process of descent with modification? That's a pretty simple story. It triumphed because most people didn't agree with Darwin's radical position. For most people in the 19th century, the equation of evolution with progress was the most reasonable thing in the world. Of course, any process of natural change would have to be progressive. The main reason why evolution became the popular designation is that Herbert Spencer, the great Victorian polymath of nearly everything, a man who had an inherently progressivist theory, not only about biological change, but about cosmology, sociology, anthropology, criminology, and everything else, called it evolution, called any progressive change evolution, and his view stuck, because that's what fit, rather than Darwin's radicalism, with the demands of Victorian society, and eventually Darwin gave up. By the end, everyone was calling it evolution, and it was not a battle worth fighting, and he didn't. And in his last book, he called it 